and welcome to the latest episode of Mystery Unsolved. I'm Justin Bienvenu, and it's that time of year. We're almost approaching the end of the year, but we are also approaching the last episode of the season. Are in for a good one? You bet. I'm not going to want to say it's not good. What would be the fun in that? Tonight's episode of Mystery Unsolved will be on Frank Finkel. If that name doesn't ring a bell, it's okay. Perhaps the mystery behind Frank Finkel will. Without further ado, Mystery Unsolved, Frank Finkel. Frank Finkel was born on January 29, 1854, and he died on August 28, 1930. He was an American who rose to prominence late in life and after his death for his claims to being the only survivor of George Armstrong Custard's famed Last Stand. At the Battle of Little Bighorn on June 25th, 1876. So, for anybody who knows about the Battle of Little Bighorn, you know it was a massacre. Supposedly, nobody survived. As far as we know, records accounts, everything for it, nobody survived. However, along comes Frank Finkel to state otherwise. Historians disagree over whether Finkel's claims are accurate. Although he provided several details that would only have been known by someone who was at the Little Big One, there are inconsistencies in his accounts of events. So again, very similar to um, the John Wilkes Booth one and very similar to the Jesse James one, these are mysteries in which people are claiming to be famous people. And again, similar to John Wilkes Booth and Jesse James, some things add up. Other things, well, there's a little indiscrepancy there. It doesn't quite add up. All right. He and others claim that he enlisted in the United States Army in the early 1870s and served under George Custer during the Great Sioux War of 1876. During the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Finkel claims he was wounded early in the fighting and his horse bolted from the battle. After being nursed back to health, he traveled to St. Louis, then settled in Columbia County, Washington. Over the next 40 years, he amassed a significant estate as a farmer in the town of Dayton and came to be regarded as one of Dayton's pioneers. Sometime around 1920, he began telling companions that he survived the Battle of the Little Bighorn. For the next several years, he recounted his alleged and for the next several years recounted his alleged experience in the battle. Historians who support Finkel's claims argue that several details in Finkel's account could only be known by someone who was at Little Bighorn, including details of events in the battle that were not widely known until after Finkel's death, and the location and quantity of streams of potable water in the area. Those who disagree with Finkel's claims argue that records at the time do not indicate the existence of Frank Finkel, and that the United States Army knows the fate of all people who have been suggested as possible false names for Finkel. So, again, as you can see, there's a, it is him, it isn't him, he did survive, he didn't survive. He was at the Little Bighorn, he wasn't. It's, it's one of those things, you know? All right. Accounts of Finkel's enlistment in the United States Army vary. John Coster, author of the book Custer Survivor and a supporter of the Finkel claims, he's a supporter, argues that he enlisted under the name August Finkel in Chicago in January 1872. August Finkel's reported place of birth was Berlin, Prussia, which Coster, Coster argues was Finkel's attempt to use his actual German heritage to capitalize on the Prussian military's popularity in the United States at the time. Koster also uncovered a document revealing that Finkel's widow believed he enlisted in September of 1874 in Iowa 
under the alias Frank Hall. At the time of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, he was second sergeant of the C Company of the 7th Cavalry under the command of Tom Custer. So I imagine Tom Custer was his, uh, George Custer's brother. Finkel claimed that early in the battle, both he and his horse were shot, and the horse bolted from the battle site with Finkel still riding. Hmm, okay. After riding for several days, Finkel left his already dying horse and continued on foot. He came upon a white man cutting wood outside his cabin. Seems kind of weird. If Finkel himself is white, Oh, he's German, but uh, it's still weird. He came upon a white man cutting wood outside his cabin. The man initially demanded Finkel leave at the point, but when Finkel fell unconscious in front of him, he took him into his cabin. The man known to Finkel only as Bill helped treat his wounds. Finkel remained with him for several months, then departed for Fort Benton, where he learned of the deaths of Custer and all of his men. He claims that he reported to an army officer to request a discharge, but gave up on the matter when the officer required him to provide two witnesses to vouch for his identity. Okay, so let me let me go back up here. And there's one part in here that I kind of was like, hmm, okay. The part where Finkel's widow believed he enlisted in September of 1874 in Iowa under the alias of Frank Hall. Okay, so here's my first question. It's not really. It's not really on the side of he was at the Little Bighorn or he wasn't. It's more of a question to me about identity and aliases in general. Why does one person claim that he took one alias, and then his widow says, "Oh no, 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 he actually used this alias." Like, where did the guy that wrote the book on Custer get that alias? Like, did he actually have an account of Custer's men? And it just so happens that August Finkel and Frank Finkel, because they were similar and it was the actual name. But then the widow says Frank Hall. So she's taken the first name of her husband, but the last name's totally generic and out of nowhere. So who's right? And if this is the case, if he enlisted as Frank Hall, then where, at, at what point did he change it to August Finkel? You know what I mean? And also, I would just like to note that it is definitely possible to fake your name when enlisting in the Army or the military in general. It's quite easy. At least it was back then, I mean. Okay. Finkel claimed that early in the battle, both he and his horse were shot, and the horse bolted from the battle site when Finkel started, with Finkel still riding. This I remember from watching an episode of Unsolved Mysteries or Mysteries at the Museum. This is where I first heard about the, the uh, about him myself. And they actually do show like a reenactment and it shows him, he gets shot and he's kind of in, like the battle's happening out front and Finkel's kind of like in the background. His horse is just galloping away. And he kind of looks back and he's like holding his shoulder and stuff and he's all hunched over. Then he hunches over the, the horse unconscious altogether and the horse just rides completely away from the battle. And nobody, I mean, and if, the, if it's true, I suppose there is sort of some weight there because his men aren't going to notice and neither are the Indians, like the Sioux. They're not going to know because both of them are in, in battle. The last thing they're going to do is notice some guy you know, that got hit and wounded, and he's riding off on his horse. Maybe someone noticed, one of his own men, or maybe an Indian, but, like, even then, like, the other thing that kind of irks me here, and yes, I said irks, he came upon a white man cutting wood. Why would you put that he was white? Like, I get Finkel himself is German, supposedly, but then again, that also initially makes Frank Finkel white. So why wouldn't it just say, it's, just, it's very oddly written to me. He came across a man cutting wood. I don't know. It has nothing to do with anything, but I'm just, I'm just, pointing, just pointing it out. All right. Into the story, 
I'll give you, I mean, my theories are going to be either he was or he wasn't. It's pretty much where do I lean after this story? Okay. Finkel traveled to St. Louis, Missouri, where he worked in the dairy industry. He returned west in 1878 and settled in Dayton, Washington. He married his first wife, Della, also spelled Delia, Rainwater, in 1886. Okay, so they, they acquired the, he acquired the farm in 1911. He owned a significant real estate in Dayton, and they had three children. A 1906 newspaper article characterized Frank Finn as someone who enjoys respects and the confidence of all good people in the community. Okay, well, it doesn't really help us here. Finkel is not believed to have said anything about the little big home over the course of 40 years living in Dayton. So that's, that's the lead-off sentence in this next paragraph. And I think it's quite telling because this is a guy that, you know, we look back at the little big battle at the little big horn and we're like, damn, like Custer didn't have a chance. But back then, as it happened and everyone was massacred, you have to remember, like, they were like, nobody survived. So for this guy to keep quiet for 40 years, it kind of makes you wonder, like, did he feel guilt? Or did he just feel like it wasn't really important for him to come forward? He is believed to have made his first claim of surviving the Battle of Little, Bi Battle of Little Bighorn in 1920 after hearing his companions discussing what he believed to be erroneous details about Custer in the battle. Again, this was another thing I had watched on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries or Mysteries at the Museum. Basically, it reaccounted on, it was like a, re, a reenactment and it showed Frank Finkel sitting on, he was standing on the porch. His friends were off to the side standing next to each other and they were talking about it. And then the camera kind of panned over to Frank Finkel and he's just kind of like, like he's all like edgy and nervous because this is the first time he's ever hearing people talk about it. So maybe that's it. And I could totally understand that. Maybe for 40 years, why would he need to have come? Like he tried to go forward. He tried to come forward. Number one, he needed two proofs of documents stating his identity, but he was probably like, you know, it's too much work. And then he forgot about it. But now that he hears his friends standing on his porch, talking about the battle of little bighorn, how nobody survived. Now it's kind of hitting. I'm like, ah, oh, geez, like, do I just let them speak or do I actually tell them the truth? Over the next several years, he expanded on his claims in local speaking engagement and in 1921 gave an account to a reporter from the Walla Walla Bulletin, the largest newspaper in the area at the time. His wife died in August 1921, shortly after the Walla Walla Bolton article was published. And in 1926, Frank married his second wife, Hermie. Frank Finkel died on age, at age 76 on August 28, 2013, a photograph described as August Finkel was published first in the Battlefield Dispatch, a member circulation publication for Custer enthusiasts, and then in December of 2013, issue of Wild West, a professionally edited general circulation magazine. The photograph described as Sergeant August Finkel of the 7th Cavalry in 1874, on a, wearing a cavalry blouse, was widely identified as a photograph of Frank Finkel of Ohio, taken 10 years before the fam familiar Frank Finkel portrait photograph taken around 1886. So a photo circulated back in 2013 and they compared the two and they're like, you know, the likeness is pretty good. Like one of those probable than not things, you know. The hair color and hairline differed due to age, but every facial feature was identical as were several mannerisms, including the shirt collar flipped up on this right side inside the coat collar, according to Mike Roncalo, a, a, pho a photographer. The owner of the photograph was a friend of Frank Finkel, as in Frank, F-I-N-C-K-L-E. That's um, August Finkel, I suppose, is the, the one there. Fellow soldier and mentions burying Frank Finkel in the same dispatch article. Wait, wait, hold on, I'm confused. 
I knew this. I knew this was going to happen eventually. So I didn't think I needed to explain this, but the the spelling of Finkel is different. August Finkel is F I N C K L E, whereas Frank Finkel is F I N K E L. But this one right here is mentioning the owner of the photograph was a friend of Frank Finkel, and Finkel is spelled as F I N C K L E. Now remember that with that spelling was only connected to August Finkel. But then fellow soldier and mentions burying Frank Finkel in the same dispatch article. Four men claim to identify Finkel and his horse, both dead on Finley Finkel Ridge. They do not name parts of battlefields for missing soldiers. So this is really confusing to me because it doesn't say F-I-N-K-E-L, which is what we've been going with for this entire time. It's what we've been going with this entire time. And now it's spelled just as August Finkel was, but Frank's in front of it. I'm trying to, I, I'm sorry if I'm confusing, but like, it's now starting just now to not add up. Um, Charles Windoff, his best friend, rode down to from Reno Hill expressly to find Finkel's body and gave him a decent burial and could not find the body. I'm confused. Like, this is like a battle. So maybe that's the case. But even then, nobody survived. So I don't, I'm really not understanding this. It's getting really confusing now. Dr. Cannonberg showed Windoff a photo of Frank Finkel as a man of 66, but Windoff was almost blind by that time and could not say whether the photograph resembled Sergeant August Finkel or not. See, now it goes from August Finkel to Frank Finkel. So whoever wrote this article is the person that screwed up. It's not me. So I think whoever wrote this, they got them confused. So where it says Frank Finkel, that ends in K-L-E, that should say August. None of the people who claim to have buried Finkel ever gave a detailed description of how they might have recognized his body. The final report of, a, of the primary source, Sergeant Daniel Knipe, was described as full of inaccuracy by somebody. <laughs> Knipe also described 60, 70, or 75 dead Indians when the Indians reported only 26 warriors and listed them by name. Knipe and General Custer were, was shot once over the Klan. Knipe said General Custer was shot once when every other witness said Custer was shot twice. Knipe failed to identify his own company commander, Tom Custer, who had been beaten to a pulp. Knipe apparently identified the body of Finkel for L Lieutenant Edward Godfrey, who did not appear to know Finkel by sight. Sergeant Samuel Alcott was not present at the actual battle. He describes a burial he attended as taking place on a barren lane, which was actually on a hillside. One thing I absolutely love, I think I mentioned this in the last video, is the fact that no matter how many people you ask, you can ask a room full of people, that were all at the same place at the same time, and they'll all give you different accounts because they all saw something different. Like, how does that happen? What do you call that? Like, Jesus. The article in Battlefield Dispatch also stated that native-born German speakers reported having trouble understanding Sergeant Finkel's German pronunciation. Author Koster, Koster, not Custer, <laughs> said that this was because Frank Finkel grew up in Ohio had never lived in Germany and had learned the Almanaic Bavarian dialect from his immigrant parents. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is. I know there's a lot there. So basically, after he died, well, actually, I'll give you two. When Frank Finkel, who claims, you know, he survived the little bighorn, when he died, it was just kind of a, you know, they buried him. There was a funeral probably. 
and whatnot, and yeah. The people who claim to have buried him when he died in the battlefield, these are people, obviously, that, because you have to remember, there are probably people in Custer's regiment that didn't go to the battle with him. So there was a lot of, there was probably a good amount of people left behind. And they're probably thankful. They probably were, because, hey, they didn't die. So these people were probably like, okay, we have to go identify the bodies. Okay. So that's probably what it means when they went to the, the battle and they're identifying people and they're like, oh, hey, his, his, you know, his August Finkel, there he is. This is him. So some people, his best friend claims to have buried his body. But other, two other soldiers were like, well, we can't say one way or the other because one guy was blind and another guy was kind of like, well, I couldn't find his body. You know what I mean? Like, this is what I'm talking about. This is why mysteries exist. Because you can't trust the word of a person. Like three people, right? First guy, his best friend, says, yeah, I buried him. Second guy, he's too blind to even make an accurate you know, description of whether it's August Finkel, a.k.a. Frank Finkel or not. And the third guy is like, yeah, I couldn't find his body at all. I don't know what he's. I don't know what his best friend's talking about. Like, why does this? Why do things like this exist? You know. All right. The moment of truth. What do you think? Do you think Frank Finkel is in fact the lone survivor of the Battle of Little Bighorn? in Custer's last stand? Or do you think he's just a guy who found a soldier's last name similar to that was just like his and made this big giant claim so that he could get notoriety late in his life? I'm kind of on the fence. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of on the fence. To me, it's one of those things because I'm kind of... I'm kind of leaning more towards, I think he actually maybe had, I think he did survive the Battle of Little Bighorn because of the simple fact that he did try to get honorably discharged. And maybe it wasn't as simple as he thought it was going to be. Then he forgot all about it. He didn't need to talk about it. He, needed, he didn't need to gain popularity. And when he moved to Ohio, people weren't talking about the Battle of Little Bighorn. You know what I mean? Like, it just wasn't talked about. But then as time went by and the older he became, the more the myth of the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand grew. Hence, we get to the point where his friends are talking about it on his porch, and only then does he realize, gee, I've never really thought about it up until now. It's been a long time since I've needed to think about it, never mind talk about it. And maybe he wanted to set his friends straight because they were talking a lot of inaccuracies and a lot of false claims. And he's like, listen, guys, that's not right. And I know because I was actually at the battle. So I actually, I, I would lean more towards him actually having been at the battle a little bit more. And one of Custard's soldiers. Absolutely. I mean, because it doesn't give you a whole lot of inaccuracies, but then again, I mean, why would you make like, why would you make something up like that out of nowhere? Because you want the notoriety, but even then. So yeah, that's where I stand. I'm leaning more towards he did in fact, he is in fact the last and only, only survivor of Costa's last stand. What do you think? You know the deal. You never, never do, but I am going to say it anyway. Let me know in the comments, or you can reach out to me via message. I'd love to hear from you. This has been the last episode of the year, because, of course, we are going to be entering 2023. And it is also the last episode of <clears throat> Mystery Unsolved for the season. But I have good news. I have renewed myself for a few more seasons. <laughs> Nobody renews Justin. Justin renews himself. All right. Do stay tuned for next year's 
new season of Mystery Unsolved, where there will be a lot of interesting topics. Just to name off a few, we will be discussing the disappearance of Ambrose Bierce, um, the disappearance of Dave Box, the mysterious poison pill murders, the Texacana moonlight murders, the Bridgewater Triangle, the death of Alfred Lowenstein, and the 1921 Mount Everest expedition. So that is just a little bit of what you can expect next season on Mystery Unsolved. I'm trying to do something, but it's not working. Anyway, thank you for watching on the playback because no one ever watches this when I do it live. Why do you still do it live when nobody watches, Justin? I don't know. I just feel like it because other people do stuff live, so I can too. For Mystery Unsolved, this is Justin B. Avenue. Have a mysterious new year.